All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, today I got about five or six uh, comments that I want to go over, and let me just start off by saying I really appreciate these comments. It allows me the opportunity to talk about things that are on your minds, the listener, as opposed to me just uh, randomly going to a YouTube video and picking on these people, which is fine. I can do that at any time, but the opportunity to engage in what the listeners are saying and thinking that that's golden, that's really a, an opportunity to to grow both the listener and me okay so I really appreciate it and so uh, Wedden 1051919 says I failed English class many times I'll never be able to learn Greek <laughs> uh, with you right there all the way alright so I want to go down here and uh, address this one right here okay I'm gonna address <clears throat> excuse me I'm gonna address all the comments um, but I want to start here because uh, this is a uh, wrath of Joe 100 he says Lucifer is Latin sir so the English KJV put a Latin word in there there is reason he is called Daystar because Jesus is the morning star Jesus the light who breaks the darkness of night Satan is the fake copy and false star stars are metaphor for heavenly beings revelation calls Satan a fallen star when he opens the abyss pit at the fifth trumpet Jude 1 verse 5 Jesus led Israel out of Egypt because Christ is the angel of the Lord but KJV replaces the name of Jesus with Lord the word there in Greek because Greek was the language of the New Testament that is why Greek Aramaic and Hebrew are important the name in Jude 1 verse 5 is Jesus which is Jesus in Greek okay so look Joe here's the, the crux of the matter the the problem is you know like I mentioned up here with our friend Wedden 1051919 I don't know Greek he don't know Greek and Ratha Joe you don't know Greek and the Bible is crystal clear that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God does man live let's see if I can support that somehow right there Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 man does not live by bread only but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live Matthew 4 but he Jesus answered and said it is written man should not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God again in Luke chapter 4 verse 4 Jesus says it is written that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God now if the Word of God is in a foreign language I'm in trouble and my buddy over here wedding 105 he's in trouble too and you know what wrath of Joe you're in trouble you're in trouble too because you don't know Greek you don't know Hebrew you don't know Aramaic I mean we're all in trouble because they're all dead languages and we do not worship the God of the dead but the God of the living and the Word of God is spirit and it is life and the Bible is crystal clear on this now before I here let's read this one John chapter 6 verse 63 it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing the words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life again I said this yesterday but I want to say it again the Word of God transcends 
all languages for all time forever and ever the word of God is not stuck in some foreign dead language what kind of God do you worship that is not able to speak the language in which you were born in all right and I'm gonna <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I wanted to get into it this much, but just think, just consider these verses here. In Acts chapter 2, uh, the miracle of the cloven tongues. And they ask a, a very great question here in verse 8. And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Wow. What, a, what was going on here, man? This is incredible. This is absolutely amazing. Every man could hear the word of God in their own tongue wherein they were born. Well, you know, we can, we'll start off in uh, Isaiah. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now let's draw a parallel in the New Testament. First Corinthians 14 verse 21, then the law is written with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak unto this people? And yet, for all that, will they not hear me, saith the Lord. That's incredible, man. It's incredible that we have the Word of God in the English language. The perfect, pure Word of God in our own language, in our own tongue wherein we were born. And yet, for all that, will they not hear me, saith the Lord. It's incredible. It's absolutely amazing. So it's amazing that people are so blind, and this is so obvious, but it's also amazing that this is foretold, that this would, is exactly what would happen, and we see it happening. It's amazing. It's incredible. All right. Now, oh, <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to... I'm going to bite my tongue on the rest of that and just maybe we're going to keep moving on. But I want you to consider. No, 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 no. Hold on. There's one. There's something I wanted to touch, man. I'm just talking about the language. Let's talk about the word. Where's the word at? The word. Lucifer. Lucifer is a Latin, sir. I love, I love that. No, I love this comment. Don't get me wrong, Joe. Because it's an opportunity for me to talk about it. It's an opportunity for us to engage in a conversation it's an, it's an opportunity that somebody might grow from this and I, you know not just you but also an opportunity for me to grow now that word <clears throat> excuse me now that word latin or I'm sorry that word what am I talking about here you got to forgive me I, I'm still on my second cup of coffee here all right so that word lucifer is mentioned just the one time in the entire Bible. And you're right, that is a Latin word. And uh, hey, this is so interesting. Uh, you know, I, I've not heard anybody preach on this, but everybody ought to be preaching on this, in my opinion, because it's amazing. If you understand Matthew 4, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 14. If you understand, this is a proverb concerning the king of Babylon. Here, let me highlight that just so we can see it clearly. This is a proverb concerning the king of Babylon. Remember that. Babylon. Remember that, okay? Because when we scroll down here to verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning. All right, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will send to heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit, uh, I will sit upon the throne. Or I'm sorry, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. All right. Now, why is this so interesting and so important to understand? This right here, I strongly contend, is a clue. It's a clue not from the translators, but a clue given to us by God Almighty. Now, what is this talking about? Lucifer, it's a proverb against the king of Babylon consider this when Daniel talks about the four beasts until the end of the world here in, oops in here in Daniel 7 he's describing four beasts until the end of the world and the fifth kingdom is the everlasting kingdom that will be set up after Jesus returns and all wickedness is destroyed. So there are going to be four beasts until the end of the world. Now Daniel, he names the first three beasts. And the first beast, can you guess? Well, you ought not to guess. You ought to know plainly and clearly that the first beast is the Babylonian Empire. The first beast is the king of Babylon. All right? There shouldn't be any doubt about it whatsoever. And the first beast is Babylon, the second beast is the Medes and the Persians, the third beast is the Greek Empire, and then we can conclude very simply and very easily that the fourth beast is the Roman Empire. By reading Luke chapter 2, if you haven't figured it out by now, um, this is crystal clear, all right? crystal clear it, you know you figure well the Romans killed the Lord Jesus so you know if you take everything into consideration is obvious it's obvious uh, in Luke chapter 2 verse 1 and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed a clear reference that Caesar Augustus the Roman Emperor had power over the entire world so therefore the fourth beast must be the Roman Empire. We know at this point the Greek Empire is no longer in power. It's the Romans. Very clear by reading the scripture. <laughs> Very clear. All right, now, um, now that it's important to understand that all right <clears throat> so the romans are in power during the time of baby jesus when jesus walked on the earth the romans are in power all right no question about it so we go to revelation 17 Uh, the Romans are in power. All right, I, I'm ha I'm sorry. I'm trying to collect my thought here. What am I looking for? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I was talking about. I apologize, fellas. Bear with me here. The four great beasts, four kings. The first beast is the king of Babylon. Right, the king of Babylon. So go to Revelation 17. What do we read here? And a name was written upon her head. Upon her forehead was a name written, mystery. Babylon, the great. She is in the spirit of the first of the four beasts, which is Babylon. And upon her head, forehead, was a name written, mystery. Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth so this word here Lucifer it's a Latin word what where are we at here maybe I uh, I need to get some new glasses but we're gonna do this right here how art thou fallen from heaven O 
Lucifer. That's a Latin word. It's a Latin word. And here in Revelation 17, Babylon the Great. A Latin word referring to the king of Babylon. Revelation 17, Babylon the Great. And you know what? There's only one language in the world today that speaks Latin as its native tongue. One nation, one country, one city, in the entire world, this day, that speaks Latin as its native tongue. It's the official language of that country. And you know what country, nation, city that is? That's right. It's Vatican City. It's Vatican City. The great whore that sits upon many waters. The waters which thou sawest where the whore sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And what do we see all over the world today? Roman Catholic churches. It, everywhere. All throughout the world. It's the most dominant language in the world by far. It's not even close, man. It dominates every country, everywhere in the world. <laughs> and this is exactly what the Bible told us would happen. We see it happening, and people are still blind. It's amazing. It really is. All right, so to me, this, this is obvious. I don't know if anybody's ever made this simple. Hopefully, I've made it simple, made it easy to see pretty obvious why why is that word Lucifer in there well it's a clue to tell us who the king of Babylon is and what the beast of Revelation is so I mean to me it's amazing it's obvious and incredible that uh, so many are blind to it but that's just exactly again what the Bible tells us so let's go on to the next one uh, let's see, we got this one regarding Romans uh, chapter 14. Now we got this great question here by Patrick. And, uh, concerning the Mark of Beast, I've gone back and forth, physical figure. Uh, and so I answered this one by it. So what truth is, quotes, uh, uh, all this is, is uh, he quotes Revelation 1 through 20. And this, just so you know, I'm not going to read this because I don't know if you're going, if you're copying and pasting this and then changing the words. So if I needed to, I would read from my Bible what this says. All right. Just now I'm more interested in what your thoughts are relating to what you're quoting there. Okay. And then he says here. There will be two reapings of the world when Jesus returns. If you are not already with the Lord or reaped by the first angels commanded to reap the earth, when he returns, you will be cast into the lake of fire sometime down the road. No, this is, this, that's not, it's not sometime down the road. You think of a farmer here living in the great state of Iowa. I'm blessed to see this every year. So when harvest comes, um, we know that... <laughs> The, the whole field is harvested all right you're it's not there are not two harvests of like say a corn field there's one harvest okay and at that harvest uh, are all the corn taken but in this in in Matthew 13 is so compared to a wheat farm okay so the wheat is gathered into the barn which is the Lord's barn which is representative of us being um, raptured, gathered together up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, And then our enemy, which is the terrors, are gathered at our feet. They are put in bundles and burned. All right, now this is consistent with, with every thing we read in the Bible regarding the end of the world. All right, it's consistent. This is not a standalone. This is consistent uh, with everything. In particular, what I like to point out is Revelation 20, when fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all, this is the bundles that are burned. 
All right, in Genesis 3, verse 15, when it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is a prophecy fulfilled at the end of the world. And this is all talking about the same thing when the bundles are put in, or when the unsaved are put in bundles and burned. Okay? It's talking about the same thing. It's repeated over and over and over and over and over and over all throughout the Bible. All right? But I, I appreciate that anyway. So I think that's important to understand. That's important to clarify. And it's important to continue this conversation that there should be no doubt what the Bible is speaking. And there should be no doubt what you believe. And um, there shouldn't be. And you should have confidence, right? You should have confidence in the Word of God and what it says. And that's what I hope to do. I really do. I want you to have confidence in the Word of God and confidence in what you believe and what you know is the absolute undeniable truth all right now let's see we got the mark of the beast and we got um, we got the question uh, oh the okay we've got mark of the beast we got rewards and then there was another one all oh, right there annihilation ism right. Right, these are great which one do i go for first here let's go with the uh, romans 14. all right so we got romans 14 we got first corinthians 3 let's open these guys up here romans 14 first corinthians 3 and oops, what's the other one here second corinthians 5. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do this here. Second Corinthians 5. Okay, so, and the question is, or the issue, topic, whatever, is the idea of rewards. All right, so let me read his comment first. In regards to Romans 14, 12, Paul speaking to us, the believers who are in the body of Christ, the church, about the judgment seat of Christ, in verses 10 of Romans 14. Paul is telling us that we will all stand before Jesus Christ one day to give an account of how we lived the Christian life. See also 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5 for a couple of cross references. Please note that rewards are important to the Lord and for the believer. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Okay, so let's start there. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. All right, all right. So this is good stuff, man. This is a good study. But let's clarify something here, that there is no bonus rewards that wait for you in the life to come hereafter. All right. Now, that's an evil thought to think that well I'm gonna have rewards in heaven and you ain't gonna have them that's evil right so the question I would ask anybody that teaches this is what reward will you have in heaven in the life to come hereafter that I won't have what advantage will you have over me hey am I gonna be in a little teeny little shack under a bridge and you're gonna have this great big huge statewide mountain of a mansion what what is the reward you're gonna what are you gonna stand over me and tell me what to do in the life to come here after what is exactly the reward that you're hoping to get that's gonna give you an advantage for all eternity <laughs> the obvious answer is nothing man you're mistaken you're horribly mistaken the reward the extra blessings if you will that we have from God apply to this life not in the life to come hereafter all right so boy oh boy uh, <laughs> I feel like uh, this could go on for too long but I'm gonna make this short here if I can just to throw uh, some ideas at you and then um, 
let's continue this conversation if you want some follow-ups okay because it's important it's a, it's a very interesting topic I enjoy it doesn't get talked about very often so I would enjoy continuing this topic there's something I want to show you first though there's something I want to show you first I'm not sure this is what I'm looking for oh yeah it is okay I had to think about it a little bit alright so if you let me find this here alright so all right here the kingdom of heaven so the parable of the kingdom of heaven that is given by Jesus here in Matthew 20 for the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard and when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day he sent them into his vineyard now this penny represents everlasting life all right and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out He went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out, and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man has hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. Beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called but few chosen. Consider, consider this. Is thine evil, is thine eye evil because I am good? Are you saying that you're getting bonus rewards that I'm not going to get in heaven? What, what exactly? What advantage are you going to have in the life to come hereafter that I'm not going to have? Think about the guy, the, the guy on the cross when Jesus says, this day will you be with me in paradise. You gonna? He, I mean, he was saved for what ten seconds, maybe, maybe a little bit longer than ten seconds. But he was, when he was saved, he was nailed to the cross. What what was he gonna do? What good could he do at this point? He was restricted from doing good deeds that you're able to do now, and you want to believe that because you're not nailed to a cross, that you're gonna get extra rewards. That's evil. All right. So you, I mean, you can have blessings in this. God will give you blessings and rewards, spiritual rewards, in this life right now. When you have faith, you have a great gift to be able to see that so many others don't ha have. You know, we can get into that, I guess. Uh, here, no, we got to go Romans fourteen verse 12 or was it 10 or 12 
verse 12. Let's read it all here. But why dost thou judge thy brother, and why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, am I mixing this up? No, it's all related. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every name shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Right, and so the only way that we're going to be able to stand in front of the judge is if our lawyer, our representative, is Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ as our attorney, if you will, we're doomed. We're going to be sentenced to death. Right? And see also... As Paul tell, is telling us that we will all stand before. Now, am I mistaken this question here? I might have missed. I might have been went off topic. I I don't know. I don't know. Too much coffee. Well, I get that coffee in me, and you gotta watch out, buddy. Stand back. That's why I, restri I restrict it to two cups of coffee. And if I had three cups, man, I'd blow up the internet probably. God knows what would happen. All right, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, I, in my this is how I understand it. Now, I fully agree that, uh, oops, that there are people that could teach this a whole lot better than I can. And you probably understand it better than I do. But this is how I understand it, is that the foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Alright? The foundation. And so he has laid the groundwork, and we that are born of God, we we build upon the foundation that he has laid. All right, and so if there's anything that we're trying to build in his name that is bad, then that will be burned and that will be lost. All right, and all the good things that we build upon Jesus Christ, uh, the things that endure forever, they these will be made manifest on the day of his return so let's go to John chapter 14 oh no I can't do that hold on John chapter 14 or is it 15 hold that thought no 15 excuse me yep 15 okay Okay. All right, so in in John chapter 15 verse 5, I am the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same brings forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now, that's important to understand in my opinion because when you're you know, thinking, oh, I'm building this and I'm building that. You're building, you think you're building your own foundation? Where are we at here? You think you're building your own foundation? You're not. Okay, so whatever we might build, we're building it on the foundation that Jesus Christ has already laid down for us. And whatever we do is because of Him 
for without him we can do nothing all right so you know you think uh <laughs> what are you doing that that isn't of God that will be given to you in the life to come here after that'll be set apart from everybody else and the answer is nothing for without me you can do nothing all right so there is no I don't know why that would bother anybody really honestly it's like, oh I'm so disappointed I don't get bonus rewards and in, in the life to come here after yeah no no, you, you've got a big fancy mansion and 27 different kinds of cars and a couple of helicopters and none of that is going to do you any good in the life to come hereafter. You think about the rich people in the world today, they got a tremendous advantage over poor folk like me. So you're going to what? You're teaching them, oh, they're going to have bonus rewards in the life to come hereafter. No. Well, that's that's just pure evil. And again, I would I, again point you back to the fella on the cross next to Jesus that got saved. He was nailed to a cross. Compare him with uh, Kenneth Copeland. <clears throat> All right, let's imagine for a moment, if you will, Kenneth Copeland is a saved man. Think about all the good that he is able to do with all that money that he's got. He's got an extreme advantage over that poor fellow that was nailed to the cross, doesn't he? So you're what you're going to say Kenneth Copeland is going to have greater rewards? He's going to have for all eternity. This is not just a, you know, a bonus 70 years or a bonus 1000 years. This is for all eternity. And really what you're teaching is a curse. That ever that the life to come hereafter you'll be cursed for all eternity. That's that's not from God. That's not from God at all. So listen, let's. I appreciate that. Uh, Harvest workers one two one eight. I'm not even sure uh, if this is. Uh, I, I hope that this sort of um, at least sort of uh, addresses your comment and question here. All right, so this is great stuff. Obviously, you're well studied. And what do we got for Second Corinthians 5, 9 through 11? If you all want, um, you look up the stuff yourself. I certainly would encourage you all to read the Bible. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciousnesses. 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 See, I, you know, I you know, go back to, you know, you, I, you listen to me. I can, I barely speak English, man. And you want me to learn Greek? Not a chance. Conscience. 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 Is that consciences? Conscience. Ah, who cares? Okay. So again, and this is how I look at it. When it says here that for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body. And there's only really two things. Are you saved? Are you not saved? This is the judgment of God. And so, all of us that have done the will of God will receive the reward from God, and that is everlasting life. Now, if, you're, if you did not do the will of God, meaning if you did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you shall be punished and receive um, everlasting uh, torment and so on and so forth and so um, I hope that addresses it to me it, it's pretty simple you cannot stray from the absolute truth of eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ 
and the fact that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right, so what was the other thing that we read here, right here? We might as well address this one, and then I'll end on the mark of the beast. Okay, so, hey, brother, do you believe in annihilationism or eternal conscious? Wait a second. So here's another one. Conscious. To me, wow, I sound like the same thing that I just read. Sounds like the same thing I just read. Forgive me. Conscience. 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 Conscious. Conscious. All right. Well, okay, so the only thing that confuses me here is in 2 Corinthians, I thought it should be consciences. Or, I can't say it. Conscience. Consciences. But who cares? Who cares? All right. So, anyways, do I believe in annihilationism or eternal conscious torment? And so, I, you know, this is why I'm against labels half, or mostly because I don't understand what these labels are you just tell me point to the Bible and I'll say yeah or nay but these doctrines of annihilationism in Christianity and I I can't even say that word annihilationism is the belief that after the last judgment all damned humans and fallen angels including Satan will be totally destroyed cremated cremated all right and their consciousness extinguished rather than suffering forever in hell. That's a little bit, you know, I don't know if I can go along. I mean, you got some stuff in there I'm not sure about, man. Okay. So I don't know what this other one is either, though. Eternal conscious torment. According to the Alliance Commission on Unity and Truth the H E double hockey stick is that among evangelicals and the majority of Protestants have held that hell will be a place of perpetual conscious torment both physical and spiritual this is known as the eternal consciousness of the eternally damned or whatever I <laughs> come on I, this is stuff this is the kind of stuff that just confuses the H E double L I'm not even out of me. I don't understand this stuff. All right, so I'll tell you what I believe. So let's get into, let's go to, first of all, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, you, maybe you could tell me, Patrick, what I believe. Uh, between the two. I'm, I don't know. Uh, that really is so doggone confusing. I don't want to commit to one or the other. Because there's language in there that I feel like if I'm a, a, a lawyer, I, I could, there's enough wording in there that I could wiggle back and forth between the two. <laughs> that's just how I feel really honestly now let's go to let's just do it this way oh how, no let's just keep it simple all right in Revelation 20 verse 6 it says blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years so if you're familiar with me at all you know I preach on this very hard and very heavy and very thoroughly Jesus Christ is the first resurrection there's no doubt about it <clears throat> no doubt about it at all Jesus is the first resurrection he has led the way and we will follow him when he returns we will be changed 
in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we will be lifted up to get to meet the Lord in the air. All right, so we will be resurrected, but only when He returns. Nobody has been resurrected. Nobody has been resurrected except for Him. He's the leader. All right, and then when He comes in the clouds of heaven, that is the harvest of. That's the end of the world. That's when we will be resurrected. He has led the way for us. Okay, so. No doubt about it. On such, the second death has no power. So right now, we that are born of God, we're saved, sealed, secured, sanctified forever. Nothing can ever take that away. The second death has no power over us right now. In John 11, whosoever, believeth, whoever, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The second death has no power over us right now. All right, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All right. He that believes on the son has everlasting life and he that believeth not shall see I'm sorry, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And of course, this is complete. The wrath of God is completed at the end of the world when fire comes down from God and devours them all. And this, this of course, goes back to Genesis 3, verse 15, a prophecy fulfilled and spoken about all throughout the Bible. So... <clears throat> We read down here that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, Patrick's question here, are they going to be annihilated forever or are they going to be eternal conscious? They're going to be alive and just you know, I, I don't know. I can't imagine. I can't imagine the scenario. Uh, they're not going to be alive. That's the second death right there indicates that they are not alive and that they are not conscious. All right. You think about the first death. Now, I want you to apply this to the first death. Are people conscious that are that have died? right now whether they're saved or not saved either one all of them are any of them conscious and the answer is no they're not they don't know a thing wasn't there something in the book of Ecclesiastes about that um, I, I don't know I, boy you I'm digging into my brain right now I just don't know There's a verse there that I, I'm think, trying to think of. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So, um, the second death, right? So, people that are dead right now, they they have no knowledge at all of anything beyond that. You think about when the thief that I was talking about earlier, when Jesus says, "This day, today." shalt thou be with me in paradise today a, clearly a reference that this gentleman was going to die that day and then the next thing he knows is going to be the the judgment or the and or the transformation from the dead into the living when we are transformed into our glorified bodies first the dead in Christ shall rise then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the cloud, the, to meet the Lord in the air. Today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. So to me, this is clear that there is no um, nobody awake. Uh, right now that that's dead all right 
Now, there, there are actually a lot of examples to give. Uh, Samuel and Saul. And, um, now, I don't want to, I want to keep this short. Okay, I'm not going to go there. But uh, just to answer very simply that there's no doubt in my mind that if the dead people now are uh, asleep, right? Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth. If they're asleep now, then on the second death, they're going to be asleep forever. All right, but there's going to be absolutely no doubt in my mind that come judgment day. Oh, I hold on a second. It is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. All right. So again, when somebody is, uh, well, so I'm sorry, when, when judgment day comes, everybody is going to stand before God. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Everybody's going to stand before God. And those that are not saved are going to be struck with the realization that they are going to be killed. That they are going to die the second death. And that's going to be the worst possible moment for any soul. That has ever lived. There is nothing worse. And I believe. And my my strong opinion is that. This will be way worse than what anybody can imagine. You, I mean we have examples of that in our life. When terror is coming upon people. And we've seen the look in their face. When they see the terror of something horrible approaching that we've experienced in our life terror sheer terror of you know nearly you know maybe you almost got hit by a car or, or something you know just it, there are examples better ones than that probably but many examples of that moment of absolute and sheer terror the horrifying well, this is what all the unsaved are going to have to deal with. And it's, I think it's going to be even worse than what we can imagine. We think of terror as a brief moment, but I believe this will be horribly extended beyond just a second. You know, you think a second or two of screaming. Eh, I don't think it's going to be a second or two. I think it's going to be extended moment of time it's going to be there's going to be absolutely no doubt whatsoever the judgment that has been given to them now, even the physical uh, even the people that are alive they will know when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven what their judgment is for them and they will have heart attacks the whole world will mourn and just because they had heart attacks and they die, they croak, that doesn't mean they're, they avoid standing before God. They're still going to stand before God and they're going to know that we that believed in Jesus Christ, we are the chosen of God and we will be given eternal life, life that lasts forever, everlasting life. They're going to know. The unsaved are going to know absolutely clearly without a doubt at that moment that they're on the wrong end of this thing and that they're going to be destroyed they're going to die the second death that that's going to be more horrifying than anything we can imagine in this world today so that's my opinion right there i don't believe that there's going to be uh, a barrel of acid and they're just going to be stewing in a barrel of acid you know <laughs> or whatever the scenario is I just don't believe that where they're going to be awake. They're not going to be awake at all. They're not awake after the first death. The people that are dead right now, they're not awake. They're asleep. 
and then so also the second death they're not awake they're asleep but forever and that's worse than anything anybody can imagine in the world today okay so the mark of the beast I might be going long here but let's try to is this the last one this is the last comment so I'll try to make it brief here concerning the mark of the beast I've gone back and forth between the physical interpretation and figurative symbolic the only reason I believe the answer is both is because the penalty for not receiving the said mark is a physical one put to death the only reason I believe the answer is both is because the penalty for not receiving said mark is a physical one put to death alright so uh, I think it's important to understand that when we, when we when we talk about the mark of the beast there's a couple of things really first of all you're not going to find the mark of the beast in the book of Matthew. Hey, think about that. When Jesus is asked, what is the sign of thy coming of, of the end of the world? Jesus makes no mention of the mark of the beast. Right? Or maybe he does, but we're just not able to connect the dots. All right, so if I were to connect the dots, I would connect the dots with the very first thing that Jesus says in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus is asked, what is the sign of thy coming of the end of the world? And the first thing that he says is, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And real quickly here in verse 24 when it says, for there shall arise false Christ. This false Christ is in direct reference to the Antichrist which is the fourth beast of Daniel and the beast of Revelation alright now here at the mark of the beast we got mentioned uh, in the book of Revelation only that doesn't mean Jesus was ignorant it just mean all we have to do that means we have to connect the dots with what the rest of the Bible is teaching okay so this is my very strong opinion that the mark of the beast is those that reject the Lord Jesus Christ all right the, the unsaved now you think about um, oh no 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 let me do it this way I gotta think I gotta think about what it says here uh, saying hurt not the earth neither the seed nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads is that going to be physical what is uh, the angels are going to come down and, and tattoo our forehead no no not at all but the on, only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads alright so this is a spiritual book the book of Revelation speaking of spiritual things and we we'll go back to Revelation 1 verse 1 when it says uh, here we better do it because I'll butcher the verse real quickly real quickly G Revelation 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John so we're being shown visions of things which must happen and so this is a vision of a spiritual thing all right and that spiritual thing is uh, are you you know it's a, really it's a it's a spiritual symbol of the saved and the unsaved the mark of the beast is um, is a spiritual mark meaning that these people they worship the government all right so we, it's important to understand that the beast is the government we go back to Daniel and it talks about the four beasts the four kings of the earth right until the end of the world this is talking about kings and the kingdoms which is government which is the president and his government all right as there shouldn't be any doubt at all Let's do it this way. Shouldn't be any doubt at all that the mark of the beast is the mark of the government, and the worship of the beast is the worship of the government. 
And my very strong opinion, the very best way to understand this is to take a look around you and see all the people that are worshiping their television and they are worshiping their political leaders, whether it be Trump or Obama or whoever. They are looking at them as saviors. And uh, <laughs> yeah, but some of them, you know, there are a lot of Christians, you know, both on the left and the right. Right. Many shall come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. Okay, well, if that's what you want to believe, that's fine. The problem is, if you believe Jesus is the Christ, why would you think that anything about Donald Trump or Barack Obama, what, they're going to save the world? They're going to make the world a better place? No, they're not. The Bible's very clear. The world's coming to an end. The world is a horrible place. And, and that's why we need a Savior to save us from this world, from this wicked world. It's like, uh, you know, imagine in, the, in Egypt, during the time of Moses, even before, when the Hebrews were there, enslaved by the Egyptian government. You imagine, oh, I'm, you know, I voted for the Pharaoh. <laughs> uh, he's going to save us. He's going to make things better for us. I'm going to vote for Pharaoh number one over Pharaoh number two because Pharaoh number one, he's, he preaches the things that I believe in. Pharaoh number two, he's the opposite. Now you're being duped, man, by the, all these politicians. We don't care about what Pharaoh number one or Pharaoh number two is teaching. We want the heck out of this place. We want to get up and get out. And that's what they did. They got up and get and got out. And so also in this world do we want to get up and get out of this wicked world. Those guys ain't going to save us. So the mark of the beast, man, is the mark of unbelief. And you think about it, in the forehead or in the hand, that's very simple. It's the work that you do and the things that you believe. That's the hand in the forehead. Are you doing what you do for Donald Trump and Barack Obama? Or are you doing what you do and believing what you believe for the Lord Jesus Christ? It's one or the other, really. I mean, either you believe the Lord Jesus Christ is going to save you, or you believe somehow the government, scientists, experts, and scholars, they're all going to save you. Yeah, or maybe you think that the UFO aliens are going to come down and save you. Regardless, you either believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or you don't. So that's what I strongly contend that the, it's all spiritual. The mark of the beast is the if you're not born of God, then by default you have the mark of the beast, meaning you believe in these politicians that are nothing but liars. All right. I want to address because the penalty for not receiving said mark is a physical one put to death. Oh. Uh, you know, I, I better not get into that exactly. What I, I had a thought that I wanted to share that would probably take another 15 minutes. But if you want to continue this conversation, Patrick, I would appreciate it. Just, you know, let's follow up on it. Maybe um, ask another question or share another thought, anything at all. I think I've went... I really want to keep these at 40 minutes. I'm afraid I've went too far again. But anyways, I appreciate these comments, fellas. I really do. Very interesting stuff, man. Very, very interesting. Very cool to see people participating and asking the tough, tough questions. This is how we grow. This is how we take our knowledge to the next level. Too many people are too shallow, in my opinion, and not digging into the truth. But let's dig into the truth and let's take the knowledge and wisdom of our God to the next level of understanding so that we can grow. All right, so anyways, have a great day, fellas.